Hi. Hello. It's so good to see you. Yes, it's so exciting to have you. So hello, everyone, and welcome to Modern Medieval, the podcast. I'm Megan. I'm Anna. And today we have a very wonderful special guest, uh, Alicia Spencer Hall. Yes, so- it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Alicia is going to be our first in the new rebooted Modern Medieval. We are so excited to have Alicia be that person. So welcome. Thank you so much. I am very happy to be here. I'm very excited. I also feel a little bit like I'm in an episode of Buffy at like the prom court and I am somehow like the prom queen because I'm like, hello everyone, my debut, my joy <laughs> crowd, sure. I mean, Anna knows this, but so I, Megan, have met Alicia before we, when I first started my PhD, I actually reached out to Alicia with some questions because I was starting off and Alicia does very similar research to me, but also very different. And I was like, well, I'm doing Buffy in the Medieval. You have done Saints and Modern Screens. You've looked at Twitter. You've talked about the Kardashians and everything. (laughs) Guide me. So uh, Alicia knows about all my Buffiness and everything but also let's face it i'm a fellow buffy traveler like let's be real she just turned 27 yeah no no made me feel old yeah no (laughs) not talking about that but alicia tell us about yourself who are you what do you oh i love a massive existential question to like open (laughs) who am i you're right so i lay down on the couch um well for my professional title i'm an honorary senior research fellow at university college london um so i'm an editor i'm a writer a researcher i work a lot on medieval hagiography which just means saints lives and critical theory pop culture uh anything that kind of entangles and explodes the modern and medieval together that is my jam and i'm also high priestess at sticker church which really exists on the internet uh which is an emporium for weird activist medieval stickers and postcards amazing so let's use sticker church Church. yeah as our segue in it is a real website it is and I believe you have an Instagram and everything. I have an Instagram and it is www.sticker.church because obviously I was going to snap that up. It was available. Amazing. So tell us more about Sticker Church and how it came to be and what it does. Ah, again, another great question. (laughs) Uh, It is a very random, weirdly important, I think, offshoot of my research. So um, Blake Gutt and I co-edited a volume called Trans and Gender Queer Subjects in Medieval Hagiography, which is all about trans and gender queer saints. Um, And for the front cover, uh, we commissioned a deeply excellent artist called Jonah Coman to do something eye-catching, arresting, provocative, um, that really kind of transmitted the message of our book which is that trans and gender queer people have always existed including in the middle ages guys and um everybody just loved these pictures that art jonah had done and so i thought you know what i love a sticker this needs a sticker so i started producing stickers of the trans saints and postcards and then thought why not kind of embrace even more the uh, wonderful medium of stickers to kind of show how cool medieval stuff is but also have more of a kind of activist bent to things to show about marginalized histories that you can have your own postcard of so um we've got also coming out i've got a collection on tiredness <laughs> interesting so really tired medieval people um i've got something coming up about the trans egg the trans egg being a person who doesn't yet realize they're trans so they're in the egg and the egg cracks you kind of out comes a trans person so i've got a collection coming out which has weirdly resonant images of people and eggs from the middle ages and birds and stuff like that so it's kind of a fun thing because again i must say this i love a sticker but also something that shows what we can do with the Middle Ages and how it matters and how it resonates today. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I I love a sticker too. And I'm realizing now that I need some to cover my laptop cover because I keep meaning to get some and I haven't gotten any because when I got my copy of trans and genderqueer subjects in medieval hagiography at Kalamazoo this past summer, the stickers weren't included with it. Though I did get pieces of a saint uh was that juana the- yes so um kevin Alfick has written a chapter in the book about uh, mother juana the 16th century spanish saint who was regendered in the womb it's such a cool story and they work currently for the va supporting lgbtq plus veterans 
And also um, they're very involved in the campaign to get uh, one canonized. And so Kevin got us some relics. <laughs> So uh, you could have a very bit of your own. I, think, I believe it was Wana's uh, graveside soil. A bit of dust. Yeah. Because um, I remember at the room you were in with Amsterdam University Press at Kalamazoo, I like walked past and everything. I was like, ooh, three things. And you weren't there yet. Was it Shannon Cunningham? Is she the yes. editor that was there? Yeah. She was like, oh, those are for people who buy things. And I was like, I promise I was like, well, they're in my bag now, so I will be back to buy the book when <laughs> Alicia is here. Do not fret. So when I came back, Shannon was like, okay, you you came back. And I actually got Shannon's card, which made me feel like such a potential, least successful researcher talking to you her. Don't about need a, you don't need a card to, for me to know that. You are a successful researcher. Thank you. But it was very validating and I was buzzing. But yeah, so I have the relic, the piece, because I also... For the audience who maybe haven't listened to past episodes, study hagiography and whatnot and love saints. That's why I think that trans and gender queer subjects is fantastic. And we will get to that. I currently have Sticker Church up on my laptop. Yes. And I hope I'm going to pronounce M-X-C-O-M-A-N. M-X Coman. M-X Coman. Coman's um, like artist name. I love those. Like the twink, holy twink, solo sticker, the hot daddy postcard they're amazing but so is everything else but the first time I opened sticker church you had those and I thought wow that is so kind of transgressive in a great way like it's really abrupt and in your face but in a fun way with like twink like a what are they label makers yeah. put on it that kind of imagery and just kind of breaking down all these expectations of what the holy is or the divine or religious ideas and then this kind of DIY-ness, but they're not separate from one another. Absolutely. Yeah. So I um, commissioned Jonah to do uh, his own kind of standalone collection because Jonah, again, is just a genius. Um, and he worked mainly in collage and kind of colliding things together. And so, yeah, there's like the holy twink, holy daddy, uh, postcards and stickers, Um I kind of, part of, I think, what I love about Jonah's work, again, is it kind of cuts to the heart of what my research is, kind of remixing, telling a new story about where things fit in time and culture by looking closely at individual elements. Yeah, I just, I love it. Um, got to get some stickers. We will have the link for everyone. You got to get some stickers. They're so reasonably priced. Too. Thank you. <laughs> um, which, you know, sometimes with DIY and homemade self-produced stuff like this you want to support and then you're like oh my gosh it's 20 pounds for a sheet of stickers this is not the case you could buy 20 pounds worth but get 10 different sticker yeah. sets it's amazing and that was like part of the aim is that like I'm not in it to make money guys I don't know if money might be nice but it's it is an activist undertaking. It is for me to kind of say, look, have all the stickers, have, I love postcards because I love sending cards and basically propping up the Royal Mail in the UK with the amount of cards I send on a weekly basis. <laughs> and just that like people can just have it almost, if it's your research or just an image that resonates, put it in a post to somebody and go, oh, that's weird. Oh, that's cool. And I can get that, that the, the joy of research that makes you think differently and feel differently, I think is very cool. And also like um, part of what we do is we sell like a manicure stickers. So they're just like the pointing fingers, which I use a lot in my WhatsApp messages. Um, so, you know, you found some of them, there are a lot of like penises in the margins. So we got them and we've added flowers and jewels and, you know, there's got a sticker sheet of manicures you can use like in your own work with like dogs on and flowers. And again, just that kind of interacting with the medieval in a really accessible fun and yet still quite like analytically enjoyable you know in your brain goes oh yeah mm, that feels good that's kind of what I want you to feel when you use these stickers and postcards well I definitely think that they achieve that at least for me personally <laughs> so so yes yeah, let's speaking of your research more and everything and how you kind of merge all these seemingly disparate but again not disparate Categories, subjects, disciplines, however you want to phrase it, because there's a multitude of ways. How did you kind of get into the research that you do? So you started off with hagiography, I believe. Yeah. So let's start there and your progression. Again, another really big question. I apologize. <laughs> 
No, I love it. Um, it's an interesting one because I think the glib answer would be from birth, my friend, because it's just the way I see the world. I mean, I can do what one might describe as more vanilla research. I can do that. I'm trained in that. But the way I see the world is of everything interconnected and how things relate. And that's what excites me about the world and looking at the medieval and the less glib more traditional answer is that actually I was going to only do purely modern when I went to university so I did a French and German degree I was like I'm only doing like post 2000 and I started at like 2004 so I set quite a high bar for like new for myself Uh, and then I had the great fortune and privilege of having lectures done by Bill Bergwinkel who is so important in kind of queer studies in French uh, in the 80s, 90s and onwards. I think around that time he was working on his book, uh, Sanctity and Pornography with Carrie mm-hmm. Howard. So I remember just sitting in his lecture being like, wait, what? Wait, no, what? Like my mind was just blown kind of sentence to sentence about what what you can do with medieval texts, what you can see in them, that so many things that we take for granted now is kind of solidified and rigid or up for grabs. Like, you know, what what is it to be a human? What is gender? How do I exert my power between me and God? But also I'm a fairy. Like just these, wow. And at the same time, what I do enjoy is that it's very historically... Uh, delimited so you know I write medieval past but at the same time there's a lot of things like we don't really know like who wrote it don't know don't really care (laughs) who was it written for don't know don't really care so you can also have these quite like intimate pure relationships with text just like as texts and that I really enjoy as somebody who's very into just like words and how they work and how they make you feel so from there I then I did a master's and I did a dissertation on Juliana of Montcornillon and Margaret Arip, who are two 13th century holy women, and pro Anna discourse online. <laughs> of course I did. I also, again, Bill, his study was always amazing because he used to have these stacks, towering stacks of books of just like really random theory and like codicology and whatever, with often with like coffee rings on them. It's just a, very, <laughs> it's a vibe. And randomly, it was a seminar, like handing out books. And I got Vivian Sobchak's book, um, Carnal Thoughts, which is you know, Vivian Sobchak's amazing set of essays on embodied spectatorship in cinema. So like how what we see on screen makes us feel literally in our body. And then from that, I wrote a dissertation that kind of then eventually turned into my PhD. And in fact, it sort of transmogrified into a chapter in my first book. That's amazing. I also just resonate so much with me in my like experience, but my person was Robert Mills at UCL. Oh, yes. I love Bob. Bob is life. Everyone in our course worshipped Bob because he, he's just such a generous, warm human being, but his research, you can just tell how much care and love he has in it, but also he brings in all these different categories and collapses and makes you rethink of things because my background was in what was 1850s sensational literature and language and race in new orleans and then it was polish posters and then i took bob's course and here i am studying buffy and the medieval but you i share with you i call it the pinball brain yes so something you see like is the ball right but then it starts hitting other things and lighting up and making sounds and it starts ricocheting around everywhere. That's how my brain and ideas come together. And I think, and sometimes, you know, it, it falls through and it doesn't become anything. And other times it becomes the big bonus round or whatnot to use that metaphor. I love it. I love it. (laughs) I think also, I guess, part of my research and kind of how I got to where I am is a certain, I would say, stubbornness in the sense of being told by traditional gatekeepers that you can't do research like this or it's not valid methodologically or it's, you know, if it's pop culture, we don't look at that in academia. That's, you know, that's just for the kind of the plebs being the implicit thought. It's not serious enough. And that really riles me because I think it's just profoundly untrue. And also it's often delivered to me or has been in a kind of like apolitical, I'm just, you know, this is just truth. This is that my neutral point of view is pop culture is trash. It's like, well, actually, absolutely not, my friends. And so a big part of my work is very embodied, political, 
kind of dis- trying to dismantle gatekeeping um, in kind of research, in writing and in kind of my whole approach to things. Which is so inspiring for me because studying Buffy in the medieval, I have that internalized gatekeeping where I am like, fuck it all. But then I doubt myself. But Anna, you are much more traditional, if one would say, <laughs> than Alicia and I. Do you have any thoughts or responses or anything? I mean, well, then. Yeah, yeah, so I'm much more traditional, like 15th century uh, person. But at the same time, like this, oh, we don't study pop culture, like wait 200 years and it's not pop culture anymore, it's history. So Thank you. It's just... Like I just feel so. It, it seems so silly uh, to sort of dismiss something be- because it's like now or new. Because and I think it speaks to this like mindset where we we really see the modern day as almost removed from history, as if it's like a neutral perspective, and it's really not. It's part of this. Like, give it two hundred years, people will think stuff we do is profoundly weird or disturbing or just funny or whatever. Um, Absolutely, but, yeah. You know, I think. Also, that point is that far more people have seen Buffy or read Buffy fanfic or bought a Buffy t-shirt than will ever interact with one of my holy women. You know, when there's one text that's first was in Latin in the 13th century. And it matters. It matters what, quote unquote, normal people consume. It matters what shapes cultural imagination. It matters what our references are collectively. Um, So in my forthcoming now finally forthcoming book medieval twitter which is about kind of how twitter is integrally medieval in various ways but it's also about why there were so many medievalists on twitter r.i.p um of some of that i w- was talking to people and reviewers and like first readers they're talking about the issue of accessibility so i was told that perhaps my language in it because I, I write in a very self-consciously online tone as a form of praxis and as a form of kind of giving a flavor of the experience of Twitter, et cetera. I was told that that might be too inaccessible. And I said, well, to who? I'm writing a very standard, like, online discourse. Uh, you know, I use the term IRL, for example, which at this point is hardly really slang. I was told that, that wow, medievalists might not get it. Like, well, but what about, you know, the people who aren't medievalists, who this is much more accessible to, and this is the way that we can then learn more about the medieval from a pop culture standpoint. I think there's the architecture of gatekeeping in terms of who gets to speak and about what and in what way is really interesting and also very frustrating still. That's, yeah, I completely agree. And that's like fascinating. Do you think it has to do with who your like publisher and everything will be for medieval Twitter or? I think it's no, in the sense that my publisher, uh, Ark, have been really supportive of the book. Um, and in a little sense, I think knew kind of what they were getting when they signed me up. <laughs> I wasn't going to be writing a traditionalist book. I'm not sure they were prepared for me to be adopting a kind of cocktaily, Twitter thread style, chatty tone in my analysis. But the reason I do that is to prove the point that why, if it's written like this, can you say, can you dismiss it as not academic or not intellectual enough? Whereas if I literally just like used a thesaurus and you like codified it into different sentence structure, you would say, what? Yeah, that's great scholarship. That really pushes things forward. Yeah, great insight. Like why, why does that still exist? I think it's just, it's still shocking to some people to be forced to interact with that low culture, quote unquote, or like non-academic, what is viewed as non-academic in something like a printed book form. That it's, you can kind of get away with it on Twitter. Not everyone can. Again, this is the, the whole big bit of the book is saying that a lot of people said that Twitter was, you know, trash, disposable. Anyone who did quote unquote Twitter scholarship was just, you know, attention hall, blah, blah, blah. But that pushing it even further when you take that style and tone, which again is much more accessible and engaging, frankly, and fun to write, totally fun to write, that even people who are would buy into it or allow it on Twitter will not allow it in kind of the sacred space of the purity of the academic monograph. And that, that again, really interests me and has been frustrating, but also very illustrative of kind of why I've written the book and why I've done the research in the first place. Yeah, exactly. You're like, I'm doing this project to point this out and to, you know, call this out. And yet you are at the same time doing exactly what I'm trying to say. We shouldn't do this. Exactly. Anymore. Exactly. Right. And, and asking you to question 
why you why you do have that reaction yeah you know, it's completely fine if you know you prefer a certain kind of academic text like everyone does everyone has reading choices and preferences whether it's in their kind of professional reading or personal reading that's fine i think you do you but my point is why if i phrase it in this way or put in a meme reference why is that suddenly verboten and why is that suddenly quote unquote unscholarly exactly um, i mean again as i'm finishing up my phd People are asking, what do you want to do afterwards? Blah, blah, blah. Big, scary, staring into the void questions. But one thing I really would love to do is turn my PhD thesis into a book, into a monograph. But the question is, is my natural writing style, I have been called out by my supervisor, is sometimes too journalistic, at least for the sake of a thesis, right? That's a very different kind of it is, yeah. expectation. But because of the materials that I'm using, like I'm currently working on a chapter that is ecology and transcorporeality and looking at the apocalypse in the early medieval alongside the aversion of apocalypses in Buffy. Oh, wow. Kind of the hellmouth, which I argue is an inherently medieval concept that no one ever talks about. Totally. Buffy yeah. as medieval. There's like, oh, yeah, it's just a shortcut. And I'm like, but that's a very specific choice. Hellmouth. Yeah. As a very particular imagery, even the, you know, use of the Spanish Boca del Interno is mapping on to Californian history and all of that. So I'm using these really big, quote unquote, academic ideas, but then I'm applying it to Buffy mm -hmm. and making it accessible and saying, well, also the medieval is still here, whether we're aware of it or not. And the question is, was, well, do I want like a general trade book that is for the non-academics or do I just shut up? I'm like, well, why do I have to do either? Why do I have to make that choice in that way? I think also saying like, oh, it's a trade book. There is still, at least again, in the circles I run in or I'm exposed to rather, this implicit like, oh, trade. Oh, there is a certain, it's a bit gauche. You want people to read your work? Oh, there's the idea that it will be less scholarly, it'll be less weighty. You know, not as good for the CV. And again, that is one, massively problematic. But two, why can't an academic monograph, so published by a university press or similar, with many footnotes, be written in an engaging, accessible, yet highly analytical, progressive intellectual style? What is our problem here? Um, and I mean, in, for my part, that's part of the reason I set up two book series <laughs> is to kind of support places for this kind of scholarship. So I series editor for Hagiography Beyond Tradition at Amsterdam University Press and for pre-modern transgressive literatures at Medieval Institute, which is based in Kalamazoo, li literally specifically to have spaces in quite, I would say not necessarily traditional in what they publish, but traditionally respectable, quote unquote, publishers. You know, you've got University Press and, you know, Medieval Institute at Kalamazoo, where the Congress is. It's a big deal for particularly North American medievalists and fostering a supportive space that really helps often junior scholars or marginalized scholars in various ways find an outlet that says, you be you. Like, yeah, we, we want rigor. We want incisive analysis. We want you to show your work, but we also want you to be you exactly how you want to say it. Do you want to be more creative with it? You know, push what we understand today as acceptably academic. Yeah, I know exactly. And have fun with it. I, yeah. I love it when you read research um, and it's becoming a little bit more evident as, you know, we go further into the 21st century and these kind of questions are being and boundaries are being pushed against. But you can tell when someone's really having fun with their writing and their research, regardless to how scholarly and elevated or quote unquote casual and lowly it's written. You can just tell like, oh, I'm doing this in the way that I want to do it. And that's really exciting. What we're speaking to also is though the gradual dissolution of the notion of kind of neutral historian or objective history in that I, you know, there's this idea that if I, for example, if I stripped out all the personality from my medieval Twitter book, then I could be producing kind of neutral, objective, and thus academic work. But the point is like nothing is, you know, neutral. Everything is subjective and embodied. And frankly, it is important that we all claim that position and we claim it explicitly. Like all my analyses for everything are shaped from the fact that, yeah, I'm white, I'm disabled, but I can pass as non-disabled. I'm queer and gender queer, but I'm married to a cishet man. And also, frankly, it's shaped by the fact that what my mum and I did as a kid, we just go to Blockbuster a lot. 
So we just watched a lot of films. The All of these things play into how I see history, how I understand the medieval, how I understand what we can do and be in medieval studies. And I think that's fantastic. Like, there isn't one single answer. And like, newsflash, guys, we're never going to know, like, specifically why the text was written. We're never going to know they died. Like, sort of get over it. Yeah, no, exactly. It's also interesting how certain disciplines come to kind of self-reflection at different times. So history, as you were saying, this expectation of an objective bystander, which is, you know, in anthropology, initially that was the objective participant yet bystander, the person that went to the isolated island and observed what was occurring and then thought, oh, well, I can objectively articulate what has happened and analyze And we know now that when that happened in the mid to late 19th, early 20th century by these big people such as Krober and Malinowski and everything, that especially as colonialist white males that went and did that, they have a very particular uh, way of interpreting or looking at things. Or even someone like Margaret Mead, who was considered, oh, she's a woman and she's doing this and amazing. But over time, that has become problematic in and of itself. Her work is still incredibly influential and important, but anthropologists have come to recognize that you can't be objective. You're going to bring your quote-unquote baggage with you whenever and wherever you go and what you do. And so it's interesting with something like history where we think that we can get into the minds and read the cause and effect and everything, that we're not doing that from our modern and personal interpretations oh totally i mean i say it uh explicitly in medieval twitter history is a subtweet act accordingly like that (laughs) i mean to me part of the joy of being a medievalist is not knowing exactly is having a text kind of be suggestive like well what can you see almost coquettish in a sense like you know the best subtweets where you're like i think i know but i'm not sure or you actually do know and you're like everybody else is guessing but i know because i have this great theory because i've looked into like their entire history of tweets you know it's that is the thrill to me it's what you read into the text through yourself and your desire to learn and know and be part of a community based on what you all kind of agree that you've deciphered in the text so that like that is doing history to me I think the other thing that's really relevant to our discussion um is that You can see it in sort of the waves of research on hagiography, for example, particularly on holy women. So, you know, Marjorie Kemp's book, hailed as a first autobiography in English, maybe, um, rediscovered in the 30s, by the 80s, was on being reclaimed as a feminist masterpiece on the canon. And at the same time, in the 80s, you have a lot of important scholars, you know, Caroline Walker Bynum, uh, Barbara Newman. Uh, Anna could be more to back her, so many more saying we, we need more to look at women. We need to kind of tie in the histories of these holy women into contemporary feminist struggles about recognition in the workplace, about in academia, finding our space in the world. Great. Right. Then you have 90s ish, maybe noughties, much more of uh, the queer gaze to medieval hagiography. Uh, and you have more people coming through, like Bob Mills, for example, Simon Gaunt as well, Emma Campbell, kind of again showing that you can understand these in terms of feminist or gender in the specifics of how kind of woman works, but you can also understand them in terms of queerness, queer procreation, whatever. And I would say now, I'm very proud that Blake in my book has helped people start to think in terms of kind of transness and gender as fluid and expansive. And also that kind of represents different scholars, who different scholars were, where they were in time in their own lives and also in culture at specific points in time. And that's how the scholarship kind of waves. I do think it was like an ocean, like waves have come through that reveal with different things on the beach that you see different things. It doesn't necessarily, the text hasn't changed, but how we might perceive it has. I think that's actually a beautiful thing. Nothing is overwriting it. Blake and I often get like, so you're transing the Middle Ages. Would that we were, would that we were, but frankly, like I've got a baby, I'm quite busy. But what we are saying is you see what you are in these texts. And that's amazing. And we should let people do that. That's amazing. And going through and 
kind of working through what you just said, using terms like fluidity, right? That's A, a big part of trans dialogue and genderqueer thinking of things, but also someone like Caroline Walker Benham and her work talks about the fluid, if not in a different way, mm-hmm. but it's the reappropriation of these terms and liminality and everything and rethinking them through that different lens or perspective. And to kind of quote you at yourself from your book and <laughs> uh, introduction, I'm assuming it's you, it might be you and Blake or Blake, but because you co-wrote the introduction together, mm-hmm. Um, But you say the chapters in this volume demonstrate that non-normative gender expressions, identities, and embodiments were, in the medieval period, very often imbricated with religion. And later on, you talk about how these non-normative gender identities, gender expressions are stories of becoming. Absolutely. And I find that personally so powerful and how there's this deep structural connection between these categories of some would say you know otherness or non-normativity and an exceptional life and you can take exceptional positively negatively awesomely however you want and I think that that opens so many possibilities and ways of reading and that the three of us could read an exceptional life through our different perspectives and come to something uniquely different, but that resonate and sometimes have friction with one another mm-hmm. and sometimes are in harmony. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. I love that potential. It feels so invigorating. This oh, thing. I agree. I mean, I think part of the reason I'm drawn to hagiography, despite, again, it used to be sort of dismissed as a bit trashy because it's repetitive and banal. And, oh, it's about religion. So who cares now? You know, beyond that is that they're all at heart questions of like how to be a human. How do I do this thing? How do I get from here where I am to there where I want to be merged with the divine? Like, how do I be a woman who does that? How do I be, and so I'm like the holy woman I look at, how do I be a mother, but also be really into God? Like just massive questions about, like you say, becoming and transition in various flavors of that term. I think what I'm also really interested in is the the timeliness or temporality of transition, which I think is assumed to be a kind of quite a binary, like a before and after, one transition, there you go, job's done. A bit like the idea of coming out is like, well, I just came out, done, that's it. Whereas actually it's a process for a lot of people. Um, I've been reading um, Tash Oaks Munger's book, I think it's all the things they said we couldn't have, which is stories of trans joy. And they speak really movingly about how their transition and their joy came in seasons. And kind of, again, this kind of back and forth and transition as also a communal act across time periods with others, through others' bodies. And I think that's actually a very powerful way thinking about saints' lives, about what we do as scholars, how we interact with texts, how we interact with manuscripts. Um, And there's just so much there, there. Absolutely. And I think also, I find that idea of seasons really compelling. Maybe it's also because I just finished teaching Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. So seasons and everything. (laughs) And as I said, ecology in my current Buffy chapter. So I'm thinking about environment and it's all imbricated. We're all one and we're all together. And it's But, um, you know, coming out, so much of society is like, oh, yeah, we're always becoming, we're always growing, we're always Mm -hmm. developing. But then when it comes to something that people may not understand or have very strong opinions about, they're like, no, it is the one moment, it is the one thing you are either or. And yet you can always be growing in your faith or you can Mm -hmm. always be doing something else. And it's like, well, why are you choosing this one aspect or facet of an other person's life, not even your own to be, oh, the coin flipped or something. So yeah, an imposition of rigidity suddenly. And often that, you know, to make something acceptable. And that is the moment where you kind of, now you can form, we can move past it. It's like, well, no, but what if you don't want to move move past anything? What if transition and coming out is part of who you are? Like what if the messiness of being human is the point? Exactly. And people being like, oh, well, trauma, just get over it. And it's like, no, you move through it and you work with it and you grow with it. Same with grief after death. I think it kind of derailed us, but sorry, go. I'd say (laughs) arguably the same is true of our work as scholars in the the best possible way. Like I find that some of the most profound allyship of senior scholars is revisiting earlier works 
the, their own and saying, now I think differently about this. So, for example, in the Trans and Gender Queer Subject book, Martha G. Newman returns to someone that she wrote about, I think in the early 2000s, Brother Joseph of Schonau, and says, actually, in that piece, I really, I kind of accepted the authors, the hagiographer's quite gender essentialist viewpoint. And I did accept kind of dead naming in various ways, but I've since thought about Brother Joseph in a very different way. I, I read the text in a very different way. I bring different kind of analyses and paradigms and essentially a different self to the text. And now I'm writing a different piece. So again, it's the same person, it's the same, you know, same scholar, as erudite as ever, as learned as ever, but willing to come back and say, ah, in my return, I see something different. There is another vantage point here. I have learned, but also I just, I have different perspectives. I think that's one, just very brave, actually. Two, beautiful. And three, like I said, ge- that is genuine allyship. And I, it's my hope that more people follow Martha's uh, example. And also we must say Ruth Karish's example when going back to her work on Eleanor Reichner. Yeah. I completely agree. Before I read this, I mean, I'm, I use lots of Martha Newman's work. She's just a great scholar. But then with this, yeah, there's also like a humbling with that. I mean, her name is one that, at least in for our field, I don't know if you've encountered Martha Newman at all, Anna. I don't think so. You don't think I'm so? in such a different field. There's like so little. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, for her to revisit and go, yes, I am someone that is, you know, potentially quote unquote a name, but I have grown and I have made mistakes and we're going to amend those i just i find that yeah so uplifting and so much hope but also again that her analyses as ever are utterly in like knife sharp of the text you know this isn't like oh well i discovered trans people exist so yeah fine like she brings the full weight of her scholarly expertise her writing skill everything and again shows us what profound progressive scholarship can do and be and also i'd say that it's very accessibly written for saying it's about often the minutiae of a text and reading different ways of the, the narrator has situated the subject and the fact that you know she really teases out so if people don't know brother joseph was a monk in the 12th century and was discovered quote unquote to be a woman at death but Martha shows in her reading, actually, that is just one suggested interpretation of, quote unquote, the big reveal, because the text also allows for the monk's community to believe that the miraculous gender transformation at death was Joseph going from man to woman only at death. So Joseph lived fully as a man in a male body during life. And again, a major scholar to be saying, like, look at these, what the text allows, these gaps, these spaces that if you come back to work and you think differently, come through. That's just so awesome. Yeah, exactly. With all that, Alicia, I'm curious, this is a personal-ish question, but I'm curious. So you've written on possibly my favorite holy figure, Christina Mirabilis. Yes, my queen, my utter queen. Um. Have you thought of revisiting her story through queering and transness? Because it's so, to use the term queer as out there and different, right? That kind of old historic version, like, oh, I always think of Moby Dick in the page that says queer like 800 times. It's not that many, but it's a lot. Have you thought of revisiting her? Because you argue that she's this zombie saint, which I also have questions about the use of the term zombie personally. We don't have to discuss that here. <laughs> But um, um, well, in fact, I did many moons ago, I think in my PhD, I did do a talk about Christina as uh, queerness, kind of almost embodied in um, the mode of Lee Edelman's No Future and his evocation of saying kind of the cishet patriarchy always saying, you know, child with a big C, everything you can get away with because we must do it with the child with a big C um, because who's going to argue against like children having a better life? Um, and it's kind of looming threat of this and, you know, queerness representing the opposite of that, like no future because queerness standing against kind of reproduction and biological ways or whatever. So I look at Christina from that point of view as representing in the same kind of structural paradigm, like Christ with the big C, <laughs> because actually what she's representing is all future, the queerness of all future in the sense that she is showing what happens to you in purgatory. She is showing what if we obeyed like orthodox doctrine in the 13th century is going to happen to you. And also like, guys, we're going to get resurrected and we're going to have a body and a soul, but it's going to be really weird. And before you even get there, like 
purgatory is gnarly and it's 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 queer it's weird and and horrible and kind of sexy in a weirdly titillating way and what do we do with that so i do think there's some really interesting space there to be for like a queer christina but i've just never never got to the writing it into a an article stage yet yeah, that's very interesting. I'll have to um, re-listen to what you just said and like, <laughs> her because there was a lot there. Um, but no, I was just curious because you have written on her. I use your work on her in my thesis. Oh, that's nice. And I just, I love Christina. Like, such a queen. I think the reason that, um, like I wrote on her as a zombie is not knowing your feelings about the term is that I was struck by why would a medievalist and quite a traditional say chapter on you know hagiography whatever say zombie in that way like what why is she getting the reaction in these circles like you know she's called just plain weird zombie like modern scholars who have hugely um what's the word like articulate repertoires to talk about hagiography going but she's really out there though guys <laughs> like she's too much and i just found that quite arresting particularly for people who were writing, like again, like kind of big hitters like Barbara Newman, et cetera, who I wouldn't expect to use such pop cultural language, for example, that this recourse to this kind of like vernacular was just really interesting to me. Like, why can't we just call her like, yeah, she, you know, she's weird, but like a lot of saints are weird, guys. <laughs> Chill out. Del- you know, delving into that is what made me kind of work through her as a zombie. It's like, okay, well, you call her a zombie. Let's take that seriously let's not just make a flippant and I guess that's again another strand that I kind of work through in all my research is that there are certain moments in scholarship where you see people make these flippant glib oh yeah like Bernard McGinn who's you know an amazing scholar of mysticism has this little bit in um the flowering of mysticism just thinking like book four or something of yeah massive multi-volume set where it's like yeah so Saints Vitae something like modern film anyway moving on I'm like, whoa, 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 Bernard, my man. (laughs) Okay. And, you know, a lot of my PhD was basically going, well, what if we take that seriously, though? Like, what what if we actually engage with what your kind of almost your subconscious or just your more flippant pop cultural, oh, yeah, Texas to somebody. What if we do something with that? What if we investigate it and analyze it and, again, treat it with a seriousness that we would treat hagiography? No, I completely agree. And I get called out by supervisor a lot for putting those kind of glib sentences in. She's like, well, what are you, what are you gesturing towards? And I'm like, man, I don't know. I I know what I know, but I don't know what I know to put it on the page. And no, I think that your use of zombies is really interesting. I just think that part of this was because i delving into the history of revenants and using lots of Nancy Cacciola and everything. Yeah. And then just what a zombie is historically. I was like, that's really interesting, but also problematic, but it also works. Anyways, yeah, so I was just curious. Again, we can always discuss <laughs> that at a later time. Bring it I, on. I just, I also wanted to mention that article specifically for what you just said, because maybe something like medieval Twitter or trans and gender queer subjects might be a bit above some people's pay grades if they're not involved or were not involved in Twitter or are not part of the LGBTQI plus just conversation at all but everyone knows what a zombie is which is yeah why that piece is what you know stands out because you're like a zombie saint and no everyone she does not eat like the flesh of humans or their brain Mm. (laughs) but everyone eats friends like bodily oils though yeah, not what done herself from yeah the holy oil secreting from her breasts but again guys this is very normal in saints lives this is not particularly wild it's yeah very i'm constantly the person at conferences and talks where i'm like have you looked at this saint they do that have you looked at this did you know that breast milk was just distilled blood but it's still inferior to semen which is another type of distilled blood full blood everybody and people are just like weirdo and i'm like it's fascinating it is it is (laughs) i mean i say um speak of what you're saying about medieval twitter i very take the point that particularly with the title like if you're not on like the hashtag like why would you pick it up but that's part of again why I've written the book is to say that actually there's a lot about the social media platform that if you are interested in like how texts work or like how do you find out what a manuscript quote unquote really means that actually Twitter weirdly has the textual modes and literal just um 
the vernacular language to describe a lot of what we do and how the kind of thought processes we have. So it is my supreme hope that if you're not on Twitter, again, RIP, that you might actually enjoy it, if nothing else, because it is very accessible. And you get to talk about like, did you know there were 19 Marjorie Kemp's on Twitter? Yes. There are a lot of people pretending to be a 15th century mystic on Twitter. How weird is that? How cool is that? What can we learn from them? Fascinating. And so I'm conscious of our time, but so you keep going medieval Twitter and Twitter RIP. Yes. So what is the future of medieval Twitter or has it shifted to other platforms for it to continue on in a different way? It's very, it's a very good question and a very kind of sad question. Um, at the moment, again, um, I love the, the meme that calling, um, the platform Twitter is the only acceptable form of dead naming. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think <clears throat> continuing to call the platform Twitter is a bit sad because it's not it's not Twitter anymore. It's you know it's Elon Musk's X, and a lot of people have left or have not necessarily closed their account, but but are not interacting in the same way. Well, you know, your feed is different. <clears throat> Excuse me, your vibe the vibe of the place is different. So myself, for example, I still have an account there. I occasionally look because there are some people I only know from there. But I'm on Blue Sky. Oh, that's primarily. It seems that quite a lot of people have moved to Blue Sky. And I think that is a good thing now that, you know, before it was very gatekept, you had to have a, an invite code, but now it's open to all. So that's very helpful. People have moved to Mastodon. Some people on Instagram, but I'm just like, I'm a text heavy person, guys. Like, I just need the text. So it seems like there's this massive fragmentation of medievalist community. Uh, at the same time, I think ethos, kind of the spirit of medieval Twitter, uh, particularly as first kind of elucidated by Dorothy Kim in, I think it was a blog post about it, it was like 2014, about kind of an intersectionally feminist political community online of medievalists talking to various publics, that or the hope for that still exists. So I guess in my in my chapter on the hashtag, I talk about like, you know, medieval Twitter is dead, long live hashtag medieval Twitter. We just need to figure out where it goes next. And, and it might not even be, you know, a social media platform. Who knows? But I think there is still the the desire, the need, the will for that kind of space. On the other hand, like the hashtag was not all like roses for everybody. And I actually did a survey of people who used the hashtag in 2019, which to my knowledge is like literally the only like official quote unquote survey of people using the hashtag and getting their responses. And what you found is that there is certainly the, uh, the notion that it was quite hostile to people who didn't have academic credentials. Uh, it seemed very uh, American in its outlook. People were concerned about potential for bullying. There were also obviously just the problems of being particularly a medieval of colour online um, and huge amounts of racism and brigading against medievalists of colour, which kind of intersected with the community. So I don't want to kind of suggest that you know, it was this beautiful utopia where everything was great on the internet. It wasn't. And also, frankly, the problem is that it can be disappeared by someone like Elon Musk, right? Mm -hmm. but it, we depended on a platform, as we all do with new social media, for our space, for our visibility. So I guess the question, the answer to your question is more like to be continued, hopefully. Yeah, it's in the process of becoming. I guess. It is. And, and I don't want to underplay. There are still people who you know, use the hashtag and kind of notable medievalists who are fighting the good fight still on the platform, formerly known as Twitter. And I really respect that. <clears throat> and often you talk about kind of, particularly say for disability Twitter that I was a part of as well, like you can't just move wholesale to another platform. Like access isn't begged in everywhere, for example. You don't always have the energy to rebuild from scratch. People have worked very hard to create these spaces and often like hostile macro cultures. And for some people, the must takeover is just yet another iteration of that. And we all draw our sort of personal lines where we feel like enough is enough for ourselves. And again, like I respect people's choices who kind of need to stay for various reasons. Just wow, great, all of it, no comment, but also so many thoughts percolating. <laughs> what are those like, <laughs> ah! Well, Anna, do you have any final questions? No, I think we've covered all of it, I think. Cool. I'm the same issue of like, I've got no uh, comments, just like lots of thoughts pinging around in my head right now. Yay! <laughs> 
<laughs> Good. I like a lot of thoughts pinging around. That's always yeah. better for me when I'm sat here being like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, but per the podcast tradition, Ella and I and Anna and I have decided to embrace this and continue it is to have our final question before we ask you for the closing notes and everything is mm-hmm. to share your favorite medieval fact or tidbit. Oh, I've got a good one. Seriously, batten down the hatches. So St. Bridget of Kildare, so Ireland's only female patron saint, is reported in several medieval sources to have performed a miraculous abortion on a grateful nun. Amazing. And there are three other Irish male saints who have documented to perform abortions in a similar, like, God-ordained fashion. I had... No idea. And that's so timely, especially with what's going on in the um, Irish constitutional votes right now, but also America horrifying with just the ruling in Alabama with the IVF. And also just, you know, was it France that just said you have a constitutional right to an abortion? So so aside from all these other moments, it's just a very timely question uh, and debate, which shouldn't be a debate. It's it's body, your choice. But to have God allowing or... yeah assisting that's fantastic um and if you'd like to learn more i can name drop maeve callan's book sacred sisters um she's got a really great chapter on early irish saints and abortion and a really good introduction kind of putting out like what's at stake when we talk about medieval saints in terms of reproductive justice so check it out so good it's so good yeah definitely going to be when we finish looking and seeing if the university of manchester has it or how i can get my hands on it Alicia, thank you so much. I just want to keep talking, but I'm cognizant of time and you have baby <laughs> and everything. But we'll definitely maybe have you back. When When is medieval Twitter meant to be? Drops this autumn. I love how I'm like, I am now like a pop star. I have things that drop. But <laughs> well, um, yeah, it should be out this autumn, maybe September, October. All right. So forthcoming, but with a actual kind of within the year of 2024, rather than just percolating off in the distance. Yeah. And there will be a special sticker and postcard collection dropping with it too. So you can make your own little medieval Twitter with some birds. Fantastic, fantastic. And do you have any final thoughts, comments, questions for us, Alicia? No, just what I really appreciate about this conversation is that there are so many people like us, I think, that are working in this way in you know, every day and how we read and what we do and how we talk to each other. And it's so cool to see like postgrads doing this. And it worries me that you're concerned about your seriousness as a scholar. Because baby, you're a serious scholar. Um, if anyone wants to talk to me about publishing in the hagiography series I run or the pre-modern transgressive literature series, just like get in touch with me. Um, if you go to my blog, medievalshewrote.com, it's a contact form. I'm here. It's my job and my my true honor to support people figuring out how they can get published, what they want to say, how to say it. So please just like drop me a note. Yes. And I can, again, say from firsthand experience that Alicia is just so warm and welcoming in her time and encouragement. Oh, you made me cry out. No. <laughs> and one final bit is that we will be providing a transcript of this episode. Alyssa, do you want to say a little bit more about... Yes, transcripts are amazing because access is better for everyone. Say it with me. Um, So I use a company called Academic Audio Transcription, which is a company run by a disabled founder and that employs disabled freelancers uh, and has a social justice mission. So if you have any kind of transcription needs, they offer really specialist services, highest quality, at very reasonable rates. So just check them out online. Fantastic. And let's all work to make history and the medieval and just life in general better, everyone. Yes, let's do it. Let's do it. So also, we normally kind of like horn out, like, do, 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 do. Will you um, do that with us? As oh, of course. Uh, I'm living for this. I Fantastic. feel like I practice in the shower. Like, hold on, let me get into the space. Right. <laughs> I am one with the horn ready. All right. So that has been our episode. I'm Megan. I'm Anna. And thank you for listening. Thank you.